So our final scripture reading today also comes from the book of Genesis. And I want you to listen particularly for what we may have heard in our first Genesis reading versus what you're hearing now in this, in this text. This is Genesis 2, 1b through 15. In the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground. But a stream would rise up from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden and in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. And the name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God of creation, who speaks and waters rise who speaks and mountains stand up and valleys lay low, who speaks and life occurs. God, who has imprinted us with your image and has formed us from the dirt, open our hearts to what it is you are speaking to us today. Let these words point us to the word made flesh who is Jesus, so we may live and love more like him. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. This might be a me thing, but I'm always fascinated by birth stories, you know, stories that we talk about when kids and children are born. Not because, and, and the reason I'm fascinated is that if you talk to different people in any family, you'll hear different stories. And that doesn't make the event any less real or one person wrong or one person right. The ch stories don't challenge each other, but they tend to color in the fullness of that event, that birthday. Perhaps you can think of one right now that comes to mind. Maybe a child in your own life or a loved one. Maybe your own birth story or a sibling's birth story. For me, I always think about the day that my niece was born, and everyone will tell you different things about that day. My sister will talk to you about how she wasn't planning to go into labor that day, but the doctor said it's time. She had a normal checkup, and the doctor said, go down the street. The hospital's ready for you. My mom would tell you about the time in which my niece was born. It was 2001, and she was born at 9, 11 p.m. in November. There was a very fresh memory with some of those numbers in our minds. But my story is that I was supposed to go to the movies with my sister that day. In fact, I was with her when we went to the, to the doctor's visit. And suddenly my day got completely turned upside down because of this little bundle of joy coming into the world about three or four days too early. And I didn't get to go see my movie all different stories about the same event, all people who were overjoyed at what was happening, but they all show different aspects of what's going on. I don't know if that was telling. Uh, I love my niece to death, and she's been a great joy in my life, but it was, it was so interesting uh, how close we were in age to have that moment where I had to learn 
When a baby comes, the priority goes to the baby. So if we're reading out of the Bible today, and if you were reading out of my specific Bible, which is the NRSV, it's the one that's probably in your pews, the title of the Genesis 2 text is called Another Creation Account. And sometimes that doesn't sit well with us. We, we don't want to have two creation accounts. We want one that makes sense, that's clean. But the two Genesis texts we read today definitely tell two different stories of creation. They aren't necessarily combating one another, they're not necessarily negating one another, but they're just trying to color in different aspects of this great cosmic creation that God partakes in. They're detailing the same event, and they're highlighting different parts of it. Genesis 1 has that constant repeti- repetition, and the, and the Lord God made the water, the firmament, he made the animals, and he called them good. That's a constant repetition throughout Genesis 1. We didn't get to read the whole thing, but we got two parts of that. All the things, the the animals on the earth that fly in the air, that swim in the sea, and called them good. Now, the first thing I want us to take away from that Genesis 1 text is that when God has finished creating, God always says, it is good. Sometimes that can be difficult for us. There's a family of groundhogs that are about to wreak havoc on my garden. I have a tough time saying, and God created them good. In Florida, we would often have snakes crawl up into our house or around our house. It was tough to say when the snake would come in the back door that the snake was created good. But what God creates, God makes good. If we can call a huge sycamore tree beautiful and good, We can also call an ant or a cockroach good. Maybe not enjoyable, but good. Perhaps this goodness of all things is what is meant in our hymn today when it says that we are surrounded by the love of God, that God has placed us in the midst of a creation that is good, and he has filled it with goodness and love, and we are compelled to praise God because of it. But the structure of Genesis 1 should also show us something else. And you can read it one of two ways. One, the final act of creation that God does is to create humans, to create people. So you could consider humans the culmination of God's creation, the final beautiful creative act, and that's why they are so wonderful, so powerful. But there's another way to read this too. You see, humans fall in the list of things that God created. It starts with the water and the land and the sea and the light and the stars, and it moves to the animals, and eventually humans are just the other thing on the list. We're just another creation of God. The poem in Genesis 1 describes, that our, crea- describes our creation very much in the same way as God creates everything. God speaks, and it is so. That's the structure of the story. God speaks, and it was created, and it was good. So, so the good news there is that when God created humanity, he said, it is good. And there are moments where that can be difficult for us to believe. But I want us to think about the humility of that, that we might be at the end, but we are also just part in Genesis 1 of a long story of creation. But we're also reminded that humans are made in God's image, and that is a distinction that we hold. That our very existence as people should be giving off the image of this creating God. Perhaps it would be enough for that truth to define the task given to the humans. Go and be an image bearer of God. But that's more about our nature. Later in Genesis 1 is where we get the language that can be so harmful. It says that we have been given dominion over creation. Now, I want us to pause and and question that word dominion and what it means to us, because at times it is meant that we have been given charge to do whatever we want over creation, to be however we want to be over creation. But the important aspect is that we were created with purpose, with power, with responsibility. There's a reason to believe that we were created to enjoy creation, to appreciate what creation brings forth for us, the tastes, the smells, the sights, the feeling. But it's also a calling that we sing and for the beauty of the earth. 
there is this mystic harmony linking our senses. Not only are we meant to appreciate creation, we are meant to have dominion. And I know that that word has been interpreted in problematic ways, and it's there that I want to focus on for the rest of our time together. And so why do we have these two stories of creation and Genesis? And I think that it's because Genesis 2 helps us define that word dominion. Genesis 2 helps us understand more fully what it means to have dominion, to be image bearers, to be those who God has set over creation. I don't love that preposition, but at over creation. So let's unpack Genesis 2, this, this, this chapter that informs and retells the creation of humanity differently. It even, the timeline seems a little bit off. It says that before that God had made any vegetation, he created humanity. So there are three takeaways I want us to take away from Genesis 2. First, you and I are dirt. Everyone look at your neighbor and say, you are dirt. If you're at home, say, you are dirt. I don't hear you. Go ahead, look at your neighbor and say, you are dirt. And if you're next to your spouse, you can apologize later. I'm sorry. But that's not a bad thing. The first thing we read about humanity in Genesis 2 is that we are drawn up from the dirt. That just as the trees of the garden later in the chapter are drawn up from the ground, we are drawn up from the dirt. We can never deny the fact that the first thing God does is reach and play in the dirt. And that's how humans are created. So I want to give you guys a quick Hebrew lesson. The word for human in Hebrew, the language that Genesis was written in, is Adam. Can you say Adam? Adam. It makes sense. The first man was named Adam, but actually man is Isha. Adam means human. The word for dirt in Hebrew is Adama. Can you say Adama? Adama. So the Adam is pulled up from the Adama. This is both humbling and beautiful, that we are just as much a part of creation as anything else we see. That God is so great that God can pull humanity out of the dirt, but also that we can never neglect to realize that we are dirt, and that makes us good, and that makes us created, and that makes us wonderful. So when I say you are dirt, I'm not using it in in a derogatory sense. You and I are dirt because God creates us in the midst of everything else God pulls from creation. But the second thing I want us to pull from Genesis 2 is that you are rooted in the earth, in the land. For Israel, this would mean, I don't know if you picked up on this, but Genesis 2 gives us a geographic location for creation to begin at. So for the the people of Israel, for, for the original readers and hearers of this story, It meant God created you to be in this place, to be right here in this, in the Fertile Crescent, in the land of Canaan, surrounded by the Euphrates and the Tigris and the Pishon and the Gishon rivers, that that God created us to be rooted in the place we are. That's something that I think our society walks away from too often, that we feel we are somehow separate from where we live and where we are rooted So for them, that was the promise of this space. This is our home. It was more than just an object or real estate to own. They were connected to that place. And I think the call comes for us as well to be invested in the space we occupy, to be invested in the land, to be invested in a place, to say, this is my home, and I'm more than just standing on ground. I am connected to the ground. We like to thingify the land, to commodify it, to say, this is real estate and this is my possession. But the story of creation problematizes that. It says, no, you are built up from the ground and you are linked to it. Maybe you can think of the ways that you're linked to the space you live in now. Maybe you can think of your connection to the place you live now. And then the third thing I want us to take away is our calling, which is restated and rearticulated in Genesis 2. 
Does anyone, did anyone pick up on the problem that God notices before God starts creating plants and herbs? In Genesis 2, it says, There was no one to till the ground. There was no one to cultivate, to see to the flourishing of a good creation. Which is kind of funny because God just created all of this stuff out of, out of the words of God's mouth. But God says, there's no one to till the ground. And so the final verse of this story that we read today is our calling. That humanity was placed in the garden to care for the garden. In fact, within humans participating, Genesis 2 withholds creation from yielding. Without humans participating, Genesis 2 says creation doesn't yield what it's supposed to. And it's right there that that word in Genesis 1 is defined, that word dominion. It's not how we've always defined it as having power over something. Uh, Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says that the image of God and the human person is a mandate of power and responsibility. It is a power exercised as God exercises power. Dominion here is not dominance, but is the dominance of a shepherd who cares for, intends, and feeds animals. When you hear that word dominion, you're not meant to get images of militaristic violence or of lording over someone. You're meant to think of the shepherd who tends to the flock and ensures their safety. The calling in Genesis 2 defines dominion. So you may be asking yourself, why is Pastor Will getting all environmental in this sermon? And I've been thinking a lot that we think of creation or environmentalism or ecology in these politicized words, and it's maybe one of the worst things we've ever thought of, to politicize creation. Because if anything, based on these stories from Genesis, based on how we understand the beauty of the earth, how we interact with creation is a spiritual and moral practice. How we look at the world around us is how we praise God. That's how, what the hymn has to teach us. How we tend to and cultivate and till the land is how we live into our created calling. Our care for the environment, for the world around us, is a theological task. It's a discipleship task. It's not a red or blue task. It is a task ordained by God at the beginning. And I feel like maybe in this room, in this place, I might be preaching to the choir. I know many of you are gardeners, and you know what it means to be in the dirt, to cultivate life year after year, to bring forth sustenance year after year, that in, particularly in this congregation versus other congregations I've been in, there are people here who know about that calling to make life spring up from the ground and to be reminded that we too spring up from the ground. But maybe we need a reminder of how God defines dominion. Because for so long that word has been used in harmful ways. When we sing this hymn for the beauty of the earth, it matters how we understand creation and our relationship to it. Because you could sing this hymn and you could still thingify, you could objectify creation and say creation's goal is just to point me to God. And that's all the good that creation can do is just to be an arrow to God. Which could be good in so many ways, but is incomplete when we sing this hymn, do we hear it calling us into our place within this praiseworthy good creation that we stand as those who have been called from creation and somehow stand in that tension between being created and having the image of God? That we have been pulled from the dirt just like the trees, but we have been given the image and breath of God in that same act of creation. This hymn means something if we stand between creation and creator and recognize our calling. Wendell Berry, in this book, What Are People For? He's an incredible author. I'm lifting this up because this would be a great read if you're looking for something. It's uh, very easy to read. But Wendell Berry says it this way. He says, the ecological teaching of the Bible is simply inescapable. God made the world because God wanted it made. God thinks the world is good, and God loves it. And if God loves the world, then how might any person of faith 
be excused for not loving it or justified in destroying it. If God loves the world, then how might any person of faith be excused for not loving it or justified in destroying it? So as we wrap up today, I want to give you guys practices for being dirt this week, to spiritualize, to reconnect with the spiritual and theological task of our connection to the land. The first one's pretty easy. Spend some time outside this week. Write your own hymn praising how God is moving around you, God's goodness in the creation around you. If you have a garden, go into your garden this week and see if you can see God's goodness. If you are near a tree, a place to be outside, not to worship it of itself, but to worship the creator who made it good. Another thing that we need to do is take time to praise God's goodness that created us, to, be, to say that we are good because we come from the dirt, to stop yourself from being thingified, which happens, to stop yourself from, from being told that you are not created good, because the truth is that you are. You are created good, just as every other thing that is created is good. And just as Genesis reminds us that we are created, it also reminds us that our identity is wrapped up in the place we arise from. So take a moment this week and name how you've been shaped or how you've been identified or how you've been grown by the place you come from. For many of you, that may be Laytonsville, that may be Maryland. Whatever dirt you arise from, take a moment to honor how it has shaped your identity and who you are, that God calls you to be rooted there. I said earlier in September we're going to be starting a Bible study about the study of creation and faith. What does it mean that God created us out of the earth? And so we're going to be talking about these discussions of environment and faith and spirituality and ecology. A, a word that we like to use in the, in, in the Christian theological realm is creation care. That Bible study will start on uh, the week of September 19th. We haven't picked a day yet of the week, but it'll start that week, and I'd love to have you all join because we're going to be talking about a lot of this very dense stuff more in depth. But maybe the simplest thing you can do this week is just say for a moment, I'm dirt. I'm dirt, and that is good, and that means... This. It means I care for my garden. It means I'm mindful of what I produce. It means I am rooted in this place. But just take a moment and enjoy the truth that God formed you from the dirt and breathe life and put God's image in you. So, people of dirt, go to be dirt and know that that is good. Would you pray with me? God, we pause for a moment to marvel at your creation. That as you draw us from the ground and just breathe life into us, something amazing happens. And as you draw other things from the ground, and we breathe upon them that life continues on. Let all we do point us to a God of creation and love. In Jesus' name, amen.